Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. Well, the old seminary joke is, to tell a good sermon, you need a joke, three points, and a poem. <laughs> Just want you to know I'm prepared. I'm very, very traditional in this, this, this morning. These are like, these are like the corniest actual church bulletin bloopers. You may have heard some of them before, but I love these, so you're just gonna have to indulge me. Thursday night, potluck supper, prayer and medication to follow. <laughs> this may be my favorite, actually. For those of you who had children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> this being Easter Sunday, Mrs. Bertha Lewis will come forward and lay an egg on the altar. <laughs> And during the absence of our pastor, we enjoyed the rare privilege of hearing a good sermon when Dr. A.B. Doe supplied our pulpit. <laughs> this one's good, too. You will want to attend the National Prayer and Fasting Conference at First Church. Your registration, your registration fee includes meals. <laughs> and this is the last one. Please welcome Pastor Cowden, a caring man who loves hurting people. I enjoy those, thank you. <laughs> this morning I'm talking about um, how good can you stand it? That was a phrase, there was a teacher in Dallas, a dear friend of mine, used to um, do a wonderful Sunday morning singles class at Unity of Dallas and named Alexis Rice, and that was what she would often say, how good can you stand it? What we teach in Unity is that we are infinitely and eternally blessed because we share in the nature of the divine. What gets in our way? You do, and I do, that's right. It's our own limited belief system that blocks our blessing. There is something in us, and I think it was in April, I did a two-part series on self-sabotage. That's really what we're talking about today. How can we um, get in there in our belief system and clean it up and heal it so that we can actually receive the gifts that God has already given to us, amen? amen. So that's what we're talking about today. So I'm going back to the Bible, back to the very beginning. Actually, chapter 2 of Genesis. In chapter 2 of Genesis, the creation is all done. Adam, the man, is there. And God says, you can have everything that is here except the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, which is in the center of the garden. And then there's a very strange creation story of the woman, as you'll remember. Bone of my bone. <laughs> And then at the end of that chapter, chapter 2 of Genesis, there's a beautiful verse. It says, and Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed. When we speak of Eden and the Eden consciousness, this is what we mean. A, a connection of oneness and communion with the divine that is so powerful that nothing is missing there is no sense of lack. There is no false belief in lack and limitation and scarcity to get in the way of our good. That we are one with all that, the, that is. Chapter 3, somebody else shows up in the story. Psst. <laughs> you remember? Now, in um, the tradition I grew up in, the evangelical Christian tradition, I was often taught that this was Satan in serpent form. But that's actually nowhere in this story is it recorded that there is... This is a power for evil. It's simply a cunning animal. I don't know ex exactly what that would mean metaphysically. But the serpent says to Eve, have you noticed that fruit over on that tree? Doesn't it look good? <laughs> and it said Eve turned to the serpent and said, we, we can't eat that one. God says, if we eat it, we will surely die. And the snake says, you will not die. <laughs> and so you know the story. Eve did see that the fruit looked good, and she did take it and eat it, and then she gave it to her husband, and he also took it and eat it, 
And then this is the part I always think is so interesting. The, the way the ancient people, peoples described the divine and sought to interact with it. Oh, also, I like to say that when we're working with these ancient stories, um, there's a saying in the Native American tradition when they tell one of their great stories. They say, I don't know if any of this happened, but I know it's true. And that's what I would like to say. I don't, I don't think this is a factual record. This is poetry. It's, it gives us a, an, an understanding spiritually of what it means to be human and exist on this plane and be spiritual. But the story says that the divine, who in unity we would teach to be omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent, you know, um, all-knowing, all-good, all-present, goes, hey, where are you guys at? God didn't see them, evidently. They were hiding. Why? They were ashamed. They knew they'd done wrong. When they ate the fruit, it said they saw their nakedness and they formed clothes out of the fig leaves to cover themselves. So God finds them or they come out of hiding. I don't know which. And then God said, what happened? And Adam said, she made me do it. <laughs> and then Eve said, the serpent made me do it. And then the rest of the story is, because they had disobeyed, they were banished from the garden. An angel with a flaming sword was set to guard. Did you know that there are two trees in this story? The second tree is what? The tree of life. Yeah. In the, in the verse it says, uh, in chapter 3, God says, because they have sought to be like us, they will be forbidden from the tree of life and they will not live forever. So... This is an origins story. The ancient people sought to understand how things worked and how we came to be, and they, they told this story orally for many generations before it was ever written down. Written in another language that we don't speak, to, in a mindset of the people that we don't understand, we don't live there. And yet, yet, there is a great truth here for us if we're willing to feel it and to open to it. And this is a story of free will. In unity, we teach oneness, that we are one with all that is. We are part of God. We are expressions of God's own nature and being. That's the truth of us. That's our Eden. And when we know our connection, our oneness, when we know our spiritual truth, we experience plenty. We experience health and wholeness. We experience peace and joy. As a matter of fact, whatever the qualities of God are, Thomas Troer said that they are life, light, love, power, peace, beauty, and joy. That's us. We get it. We live in Eden. And yet we have a choice, don't we? Truly, the choice comes down to God or not God. In the eternal truth, in the, the absolute, I've been talking a little bit about the absolute and the relative. In the absolute, we actually cannot choose not God because we're still in it, of it, expressing it, even when we think we're not. It is in our awareness and our experience that we choose not God. Why would we ever do that? Do you have a family? <laughs> were you born... There's something about the evolutionary of nature of spirit in human, humanity, that is being revealed over many generations. And we come to our truth by seeing our not truth often, yes? Have you had this experience? Have you ever been confronted with a false belief so much that it just shows itself to you right here and you are forced to choose? Do I really believe that's true of me or will I turn back to God? and a spiritual truth. That is the meaning of this story of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good or evil. We are at choice in every moment to return our awareness to the thought of the presence of God. Ernest Holmes, the author of Science of Mind, he says this, the realization of the presence of God is the most powerful healing agency known to the mind of God, man, the mind of man. I would say it's the only one, truly that when we choose to see and experience the presence of God as reality, we are healed and revealed. This is our truth. We return to Eden. To place the metaphysical interpretation on this story, I would say that every time we do that, the angel welcomes us to the tree of life. Every time we return 
our thought to the truth of oneness, the truth of life, and the truth of love. Well, that's it. We're done. See you later. (laughs) Have you noticed that it's a process, this spiritual life, this healing journey that we're all on, this transformational experience? It changes over time. So today I want, to, uh, I want to talk about three really fun topics. I want to talk about regret, guilt, and shame. Are you in? Okay. <laughs> These are three things that will keep us out of Eden, keep us out of the garden, keep us out of our awareness of God's presence. Regret. These are all have to do, there are other things too. Ken is going to sing a beautiful song at the end of service. Don't leave early. You don't want to miss it. It's about um, fear as being another one. But I want to focus on these three, our relationship with what has happened in our life. Regret simply means I wish it had been different. And it is very human. Does it take us out of our connection? Yes. Also, just so you know, I'm going to give you an antidote to all three of these. Are we ever going to grow past regret? I don't think so. See, sometimes we regret our actions and our choices, and sometimes we regret that it just happened the way it happened. Have you ever made a choice that you know, even looking back, it was the right choice to make, and yet people were hurt by your actions and your decision? Have you had that experience? I certainly have. And I have some regret when I think on those things. Maybe I could have said it more kindly. Maybe I could have, maybe, I don't know. But anyway... What I want to tell you is that it's okay to have regret, and yet it will still take us out of our connection. So the antidote to regret is this, to love your journey. Maya Angelou wrote a book that's based upon the old spiritual, wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Can you begin to see that even that has brought you to this moment of being able to choose God? And so whenever you are um, caught by regret, the antidote is to love your journey. Bring love, surrounding love to all those who maybe were hurt by your choices, whatever, just bringing love to it. The second thing I'd like to talk about today is guilt. Guilt means I did something wrong. That's all it means. Anyone not guilty of being guilty sometime? We've all made mistakes, right? Scripture tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the error of the, the, the kingdom of God. We have all missed the mark, the archery term for sin in Aramaic. We've all not quite hit it sometimes. The antidote for guilt is responsibility. It's to simply own your mistake and make amends. Fix it. Talk about it. Ask forgiveness. Make reparations if necessary. But here's, there's a great quote by Lawrence Durrell, the novelist who wrote the Alexandria Quartet. He says this. I'm going to read it. (laughs) I don't trust myself. Guilt always hurries towards its complement, punishment. Only there does its satisfaction lie. See, if you stay in guilt, you will find a way to be punished. Your subconscious mind will create situations where your guilt will find satisfaction in being punished. I first heard this in the 12-step rooms, and I was really scared of those amends steps, steps 8 and 9, where I had to make a list of the people I had harmed and then go make amends. I didn't want to do that. And there was an old-timer. He'd been sober for over 40 years, and he gave me this quote. He said, guilt rushes towards its complement, punishment. Only there does its satisfaction lie. In other words, you can't stay in guilt. This is the essence of self-sabotage, I believe, where we feel ourselves to be wrong less than having been wrong or done wrong, and so we will create, using our own divine creative energy, we will create negative situations that will punish us for our, our perceived wrongdoing. So, if you've done something wrong, make amends. Take responsibility. Everybody is human. We all make mistakes. My friend Kathy Hearn says that spiritual community is where we get to grow up all over each other, where we come together and we can be truthful about it and move on past it. Okay? That's how we do with guilt. Take responsibility. Shame. 
Guilt, in the short term, if we use it correctly, will move us into right action and reparation. Shame does no such thing. Shame is toxic. Shame will wear us down. It's not even in self-esteem. It's self-image, self-worth, who we know, our our deepest identity. If we don't deal with our shame, we will continue to create out of a false identity and a false narrative of who we are, and we will draw into our experience everything that is unlike our truth, but is like our shame. This is not an easy message this morning, I know. Brene Brown, the wonderful teacher, she's a U of H professor, and she was sent into viral fame a few years ago when she did her TED Talk on the power of vulnerability. She's a shame researcher. Doesn't that sound like a fun job? (laughs) But in her dozen plus years of researching this, she says this, all of us carry shame. The less you talk about it, the more you have it. She says this, shame loses power when it is spoken. About four weeks ago, my mom came to visit and John got to meet her for the first time. A little awkward, my little Pentecostal Oklahoma mama. (laughs) And so John seeks to like kind of lighten the situations like, I bet you have a really good story about when Michael was little and thinking he would get some cute little anecdote. My mom proceeds to launch into this story the time I got falling down drunk at 15. (laughs) There were bodily fluids involved. I I had left muddy footprints up the side of the house getting back. I mean, it was, I'm I'm feeling awkward. I'm feeling regret, guilt, and shame all in the same moment. (laughs) Thanks, John. (laughs) And so I was thinking about that story this morning. I was, knew I was going to share it with you. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go into the whole story, but it was quite interesting. <laughs> but I actually went, I went back a couple of steps in the story. Why did I do that? And the reason I did it is because I felt I didn't belong. I was a 15-year-old kid. I was a good kid. I really was, but I had a terrible secret. I was gay. I knew since I was 11. In that world, there was no place for for me to be honest about who I was. Such deep shame I carried around that. And so I thought if I could drink like the other kids were drinking, maybe that, then I could have a sense of belonging. But it was a a false move in my, in a, a false attempt to meet a true need of belonging. And, uh, Anyway, that, it did scare me, and that, that situation kind of propelled me into this being a really good kid, following all the rules. I was quite devout from the time I was 15 until I was 19. I went to Oral Roberts University. I'll tell you more about that story later. <laughs> but those years of being an outwardly devout, upright young man, still carrying the shame within me. That shame eventually led me to drink addictively. In my 20s, you know that story. And the healing came when I found community and I began to speak about the thing that I had been ashamed of. The antidote to shame, my brothers and my sisters, is empathy. Me too can heal shame and separation. Because truly, we're all human. We're all divine. Our experiences are very human. And when we can share with each other where we are in community, we experience true belonging, and our shame is healed. Remember, I've got to say it again. I want to make sure I get it right. Shame loses power when it is spoken. You're going to be invited in the next couple of weeks, starting today, really, with a volunteer fair, to enter into community in a deeper level. I like to say church is not a spectator sport. (laughs) To get the good stuff, well, like with anything, giving and receiving are the same thing. The willingness you are to give of yourself into this community is the exact measure you will receive the gifts of spiritual community. 
this is the way it works. And if you can begin to build friendships here, find your tribe. You begin to find within a spiritual context people who will hear your human experience and hold you in empathy and compassion and at the same time know your spiritual truth. You are a child of God. You are light and love, having a, what's the thing, a joy ride in a human experience. That when we are locked in our own sense of guilt, shame, regret, not enough, if we can get outside of ourselves and begin to give of ourselves, we will find connection. We return to the garden. Brene Brown says, belonging is the innate human desire to be part of something larger than us. Because this yearning is so primal, get this, we often try to acquire it by fitting in and seeking approval, which are not only hollow substitutes for belonging, but often barriers to it. Because true belonging only happens when we present our authentic and perfect selves to the world, our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of self-acceptance to bring our authentic, what is it, imperfect selves to the world, we began to see that we're okay. This week at Big Sky, I had the chance to speak on Monday night, and it was a smaller group, about 150 of us, about, I think, 15, 20 folks from our community there, and I felt loosened up a little bit and shared some stories I probably wouldn't share on the pulpit yet on Sunday. And later, I was having a little shame attack around it, feeling like, oh, maybe I shared too much. And there's one person in particular, I just just didn't know how that was received. And I shared some of my journey of uh, healing. And and then on the last morning, I got a hug from this person. And he said, that thing that you were talking about, me too. I'm not up here sharing so many personal details because I love it. I'm here to model for you that the path to wholeness is a revelatory one, that shame loses its power when it is spoken, and that we are then empowered to be the full expression of God that we are right in our family, right where we work, right in this church full of imperfect people, in case you hadn't noticed. This is the healing journey for us all. In two weeks, we're going to launch these small groups. I truly believe that this is the direction our church is moving. We'll continue to have classes and programs and events and speakers, and Deepak will be back. Don't worry. But I want us to find more and more opportunities where we can come together with six or seven people or two or three people and share our stories Let people know who you are. I remember that same guy who gave me the Durrell quote. He said that there were things I swore to God I would take to my grave that I have now spoken from the podium in front of 500 people. (laughs) Me too. I gave you the joke. I gave you the three points. Here is your poem. This is based upon the writing of Hafiz, the great Sufi mystic. It's by Daniel Ladensky. One day the sun admitted, I am just a shadow. I wish I could show you the infinite incandescence that has cast my brilliant image. I wish I could show you when you are lonely or are in darkness, the astonishing light of your own being. Something is happening in this community, and it's because you are willing to be who you are, to bring it all and shine. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.